few months ago, I made a video praising NASCAR, talking about all the ways they're improving and evolving with the times. So now here's what they're doing wrong. There was once a time when just as much as basketball players or baseball players, NASCAR drivers were household names in the United States. Names like Jeff Gordon, Tony Stewart, and the ever-marketable Dale Earnhardt Jr. And how could they not be? Gordon cleaned house in the 90s, the interviews alone immortalized Stewart, and no matter what channel you were watching, you were bound to see Dale Jr. during a commercial or, in some cases, in the show you were watching. These days, however, NASCAR drivers are largely absent from the public eye, so much so that calling them names at all is being quite generous. A few years ago, Kyle Larson put together the most dominant season since Gordon in 98 by winning 10 races, consisting of two three-race win streaks, and the championship. And yet, despite also winning the SB against a stacked class of Max Verstappen and Alex Pillow, he said that not much changed. While the fans appreciate him, he never really received more admiration or praise from those outside the NASCAR bubble. Now granted, the sport may be reluctant to put him in the limelight given recent events, but what about Chase Elliott, Joey Logano, Ryan Blaney? How come the majority of the public has no idea who these people are? What are they doing wrong? Or rather, what is NASCAR doing wrong? When the NBA first started allowing brands on jerseys and the NHL started putting sponsors on helmets, fans went ballistic, as seeing anything more than their team's emblem embroidered on their athletes was just too much to fathom. Well, compared to them, NASCAR is a marketing machine, as it's commonplace to see dozens upon dozens of logos plastered on the car and driver alike. While other sports teams make their mark through their logos, colors, and style, NASCAR cars these days only have one control variable, the number, and even that's subject to change. Hell, even the colors we fly, the very essence of a team's design is based entirely on who's sponsoring them. For the first nine years of his career, Dale Earnhardt was all blue and yellow, mainly influenced by his sponsor, Wrangler Jeans. But once GM Goodwrench started footing the bills, he became the man in black we all know today. I mean, imagine if the Denver Broncos changed their colors to silver and teal just because Lewis Hamilton bought a stake in the team. It's not simple, it's not uniform, it's racing. And I don't think the teams or sponsors would have it any other way. It's a unique and effective form of advertising that you can't really get anywhere else. And for the teams, it's their lifeline, as these kinds of partnerships regularly funnel tens of millions of dollars into the team's system each and every year, which, after a weekend at Talladega, they might need. All of this is to say that compared to the stick and ball sports NASCAR is trying so desperately to become, it's practically built to sell products. A whole legion of 750 horsepower billboards flying around each and every weekend. But it isn't enough to just stick your logo on a car, as the effectiveness of the advertisement largely depends on the advertiser, and some of the best do everything in their power to stand out. Brands like Bush Beer and M&M's have not only sponsored the best drivers to ensure they end up in victory lane as much as possible, but they've also run a myriad of flashy, bombastic paint schemes that ensure they stand out no matter where they finish. I'm also tempted to include Ally Bank as well, but this past year was kind of a miss. I mean, Ally, you had one of the best-looking hoods in racing. Why did you ditch it? And don't even get me started on FedEx. For their first 10 years of partnership, Denny Hamlin's car would alternate between orange, red, green, and blue, depending on what subsidiary was sponsoring the weekend. In late 2016, however, they switched to all orange, and things have never quite been the same. In the past year, for the very first time, FedEx has scaled back their sponsorship from 30 races to just 13. And still, they're one of the more faithful examples in the field. Year-long uniformity is a thing of the past, and while some teams have found ways to maintain it, like Trackhouse with their numbers slashed or RFK with the side swoosh, season-long loyalty has become a rarity. In recent years, we've seen an onslaught of advertisers who realize that it's far cheaper to sponsor one race rather than the whole year. And so we end up with the same car repping 10, 20, even 30 different brands in a single season. By my count, this year's champion, Ryan Blaney, sported 18 different brands due to his sponsorship with Menards. That's a new logo on the hood every two races. And because of his partnership with Kroger, this year's Daytona 500 winner, Ricky Stenhouse, had 34 different paint schemes. 34. In a 36-race season! 20 years ago, this would have been unthinkable. But the sports changed, and while more brands are involved than ever before, this change has come with a major downside. When a sponsor signs on for just one race, that's usually all it is, a one-off way to get your name out there. But when you sign on for a full year, you're not just joining the team, you become the team. You become an ambassador, not just for the car you support, but for the entire sport. Let me put it like this, how many young fans do you think the Home Depot or Lowe's inspired with their shopping carts, or UPS when they rolled out this baby? And while I never cared for him on the track, I'd be lying if I said my eyes didn't naturally find their way to Kyle Busch's car as even in the deepest fields, the M&Ms always managed to stand out. 
Today, not a single one of these sponsors remain, and the racing world is less colorful because of it. But more so than that, NASCAR has lost its best link to the general public. 20 years ago, the sport was dominated by name brand stores and name brand products. Lowe's, Napa Auto Parts, Budweiser, Sharpie. Now fast forward to today and you get HendrickCars.com, Worldwide Express, 3 g Yeah, not the same brands you know and love. While admittedly, we should be encouraging any company who can to support the sport we love, after all, expansion to different markets is what NASCAR is striving for right now, but when those companies have no intrinsic value to the fans, they aren't nearly as effective, because it's not just about what you do on the track, but also what you do off of it. Brand deals, endorsements, meet and greets, and especially TV commercials. The drivers of the 90s and 2000s weren't exactly winning any Oscars, but getting them in front of a camera was about the best thing those sponsors did. Sure, they could have gotten anyone in these ads, but there was just something better about Dale Earnhardt teaching the Tasmanian Devil to drive, or Kyle Busch getting tied up by the M&Ms, or the entire Toyota lineup being terrorized by an eight-year-old with a controller. Nowadays, these kinds of commercials, with a script and a crew and, you know, effort, are all but extinct. The last time Chase Elliott was in a nationally aired commercial was almost three years ago. Chase Elliott, NASCAR's perennial most popular. I'm sure he's got a lot on his plate already, but why can't he be like Truex and sing Napa Know How? Look at it this way. It would give them an excuse to dress up Rick Hendrick like Elvis. Now, some might think that an idea like this would be too silly, but that's kind of the point. Now more than ever, we need NASCAR stars to come out of their shells, to show their true personalities. Many fans, however, think there isn't enough personality to begin with, to which I have a few things to say. If you're a race fan and haven't listened to the Dale Jr. download, then let me be the first to tell you, you're missing out. It's more than just a podcast. It's a time machine that takes you through the greatest stories from NASCAR's past, present, and future, spearheaded by the whimsy of Mike Davis and the insight of Dale Earnhardt Jr. These two alone could make for one of the most entertaining talk shows of all time. But what makes the download truly stand out is its guests. Richard Petty, Daryl Waltrip, Jeff Gordon, Tony Stewart, icons of the sport and an hour-long tell-all, and the best part is, it's totally free and available to listen to right now. Beyond the living legends, however, Dale also interviews the stars of today, and while the conversations aren't confrontational per se, he doesn't mince words about delivering on the things viewers want to know. All of this is to say that I have listened to tens, hundreds, I'd venture to say thousands of hours of this podcast, and let me also tell you, these drivers have plenty of personality. To me, it's not a problem of personality. It's how NASCAR muddles them. While this has changed in recent years, it wasn't uncommon for even the slightest implication at folly in the sport to land you a hefty fine. And beyond that, public relations representatives used to work on behalf of the sponsors, meaning that it was in their best interest to get their drivers in front of as many cameras and microphones as possible. But nowadays, the PR people work on behalf of the team, and thus their alliance has shifted more toward babysitting than promoting. If NASCAR wanted to hush their personalities, they've certainly succeeded. But the unintended consequence is a sport without character, without the great names and faces that made it what it once was. Speaking of those great names, a lot of them left the sport in the late 2010s. Gordon, Stewart, Jr., and a whole mess of other superstars that had represented the sport for the past decade plus. It all came to a head in 2020, when Jimmy Johnson made what were supposed to be his final starts, and while he has returned in some capacity, it left an undeniable void. He had competed for the championship in 19 straight seasons, hogging seven of them for himself. Once he left, the next best was Kyle Busch with just two, which would come to be matched by Joey Logano a couple years later, and then a whole heaping laundry list of one-time champions. This might be great for parody, giving everyone an even slice of the pie, so to speak, but what happens when you have no more superstars, no more generational talents to take the fight straight to Petty or Pearson? You get the sport today, a bunch of no-names left to forever chase unattainable records. On a race-to-race -race basis, I've made it clear, I think NASCAR has worlds more entertainment value than Formula One. But a comment I've received a lot is one referencing the bigger picture, how dominance, while slow and tedious in the moment, will eventually lead to something bigger. Every time you watch Max Verstappen whoop the field by a whole lap, you're not just watching him win, you're watching him clear another rung on the ladder to greatness. It's not out of reason to say he could break Hamilton's records in wins and championships before he even turns 30. It's utterly astounding, and NASCAR just doesn't have anyone like that right now. Sure, Kyle Larson put together a great season in 2021, but he hasn't even come close to matching it in the two years since, and he's still the winningest driver in that time. Young Money is the closest NASCAR has to a superstar right now. And it makes me wonder, what of the young talent rising through the ranks? Could one of them take center stage? 
In a press conference earlier this year, Kyle Busch made it clear just how much respect he feels he's been getting from today's youth. That's the, that's the key part. Now you're going down the right path, as we have completely lost any sense of respect in the garage area between drivers. It might sound harsh, but this kind of talk is nothing new. For years, it's been discussed in various circles, mainly regarding the ARCA series. How a legion of high schoolers who've never had to build their own race cars are treating the track like a demolition derby. And now a lot of those youngins are coming up to the big leagues and treating NASCAR just the same. I mean, we saw just as much in the truck series finale a few weeks back. Another prime example is that of Joe Gibbs' grandson, Ty, whose antics at Martinsville last year catapulted him to public enemy number one overnight. Not once, but twice did he run his own teammates off the road and cost them both a shot at victory, or at least a halfway decent finish. And then he went on to unceremoniously take the win for himself. That was a bad look, but it would only get worse, as minutes later he would hand grenade the front stretch and give out every excuse in the book. It was just hard racing, I didn't want to wreck him, it's all or nothing. To say he had little remorse would be a gross understatement, and if all that wasn't enough, here's what he would say later on. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I always go back to you know, the same the same verse that, you know, Jesus was hated first and among all the people. Now, this is one of the more extreme examples, but it still paints the picture. Drivers who get coddled too young end up with no appreciation for what they do or who they do it with. Drivers like Gibbs have never had to build connections or even show respect because, as Steve Letarte put it, his name is on the building. That ride in the Cup Series was destined for him the moment he first got behind a wheel. And when you show anything but appreciation for that kind of pampering, it leaves a sour taste. A primary proprietor of NASCAR's Golden Age was announcer Ken Squire, who described the appeal of the sport as common men doing uncommon things, a call back to a time when a mechanic, a playboy, an actor, or even an outlaw could forge their own destiny and make history for themselves. But those days are now long behind us. If you're gonna run at the top level of any motorsport, it's not enough to start as a teen. Hell, it's barely enough to start as a child. Until you retire, you have to devote the bulk of your life as a conscious human to racing cars. And while that might be a recipe for success, it's also a double-edged sword. Fans don't connect to today's drivers because, as far as they know, there's nothing to connect to. No similarities, no appealing traits, no relatability. This is why I personally love Ross Chastain, and I think a lot of his fans would agree with me. Because he's not just some kid who popped out of the womb and into a driver's seat, but started as a watermelon farmer in the family business. And even after that, he had to scrape and claw for every seat, every step of the way. He didn't even run his first full cup season until he was 28, but once he did, he started making headlines and never looked back. These are the kinds of racers who made NASCAR what it was, but I fear they could become a dying breed. Teams tend to go where the money is, and while everybody loves an underdog story, they're underdogs for a reason. They might be scrappy, but they'll never have the backing of a Ty Gibbs. I hope I'm wrong, but as with most things, only time will tell. Look, a lot of this video can be boiled down to me ranting about things I don't truly know much about. I am just a fan, after all. A distant observer with no skin in the game. But you know who else used to be a fan? Him. And him, and him, and him, and him, and him, and all of these guys. Every single one of them used to be in the same boat that we are. They know what they love about the sport, and they know what they want to see improved. They might not be the superstars of the past, but they're supposed to be the superstars of today, and NASCAR needs to start treating them as such. Let them be themselves, speak their minds, build rivalries, squash beef, and all of that without immediately stepping in and handing out fines. Furthermore, get them on podcasts, talk shows, game shows, show shows, get their names out there, get their stories out there. That way the sponsors will come, the sport will thrive, and the fans will once again have something or someone they can connect to. NASCAR has plenty of personality, they just need to show it. When talking personality, you also have to consider the future. New blood, new faces, new legacies to carry the torch into the next generation. And my friends at AE Engine just helped to announce a new truck team gearing up to do just that. That's right, hailing from the 46th state in the U.S., Faction 46 is a brand spanking new truck series team based out of Grove, Oklahoma, and co-owned by Lane Moore and his son Logan. This newfound Chevrolet team has already established strategic partnerships with industry-leading companies, including a technical alliance with Nice Motorsports, one of the most prolific, competitive teams in the field. Needless to say, great things await this new venture, and I appreciate them, as well as the folks at AE Engine, for letting me help spread the word. For more updates and announcements, be sure to follow their social media and visit their website to sign up for their newsletter and enter for a chance to win a prize pack. And also, be sure to tune in to Daytona in February, when Faction 46 joins the fray.